Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for another great opportunity that you've given us to gather at thy presence so that we can learn of you. We bless you because your word is life and light, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. I bless you because each time we come, you reveal some truth in your word that places us on the right path that take us nearer and closer to you and prepare us for the eternal life that you have prepared for us. I just worship and adore you this day. I magnify and glorify your holy name this moment. I thank you because you've already promised that we two or three are gathered together in your name. There you will be in the amaze. We are more than that number now. Uh, both those present here and online, I just bless and worship you for everything. I know you are here with us and with, from wherever we are connecting from. I'm asking, dear Savior, you will speak to us, you will bless us, and you will glorify your name in our lives in Jesus' name. I ask, dear Savior, that every word of yours that we are going to read, we are going to see, will become like the living prophecy that will be fulfilled in our lives as we obey and put them to practice in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. In Jesus' glorious name, we pray right now, Lord, I take authority over every plan of the enemy, destroy every work of darkness, I flush out everything that is not of you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. In Jesus' glorious name, we pray. Amen. Tonight, as we are continuing in our systematic studies in the book of Acts, continuing from where we stopped last, last time, we are looking at uh, Acts chapter 9 from verse, verse 1 down to verse 19. I have titled this study, A Diamond in the Rough, and you will soon see the reason why that title is appropriate and how it can benefit every one of us. I'm going to read the text first, and then I'm going to comment on the things that God has laid in my life, uh, in my mind to share with us, which I believe will bless us and will enable us to become just the vessel of honor that God wants us to be. Uh, we've done a lot of studies in Acts. In Acts chapter 8, we saw the persecution on the early church and how that the disciples uh, is, uh, ran away to various places, but the apostles remained at Jerusalem. We focus on the story of Philip going, going to uh, Samaria, preaching the gospel, great revival broke out, how the apostle Peter and John went there uh, to, uh, to see the work and to impart blessings onto the people. So this is a continuation directly after that. As a result of that persecution that scattered the church in Jerusalem, uh, 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 Saul saw it as an opportunity not only to stop at Jerusalem, but to take the persecution to everywhere that those believers had uh, run to. And he obtained letters and authorities from the high priest uh, to go and arrest the people wherever they could be found, put them in prison, or do whatever he wanted to do to them. On this occasion in chapter 9, he was on his way uh, to Damascus. Let's see what happened there. It says in verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. See two things there, threatening and slaughter. That means killing. Uh, uh, breathing out uh, uh, threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went on to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly they shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the priest. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, 
What wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the man which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But there led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain de Damas sorry, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tassos. For behold, he prayed. And I've seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy sins at Jerusalem. And here he had authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scarce. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. What a wonderful story. On the way to Damascus to persecute, to slaughter, and to bind people and bring them uh, to Jerusalem for trial, a miracle took place. Jesus appeared to him in the form of a bright light. When he saw the light, <clears throat> He fell off from whatever animal he was using, fell to the ground, and became blind even at that very moment. The people that were with him had to lead him by hand into Damascus, and he stayed there in the house of somebody. Just imagine uh, the zeal with which he left Jerusalem. The high expectation that I will get them, anybody I find, I'm going to bind, I'm going to take them back to J J Jerusalem. If they want to oppose, they can be slaughtered, they can be uh, killed, they, uh, anything could happen to them. And the pomposity with which he went, everything vanished when the Lord appeared to him, when he became blind, and when he could not see. The person who was going, to lead people bound onto Jerusalem became uh, was now led by others into Damascus. And when he got there, it was like all his wall has collapsed around him. And uh, I wouldn't believe that the person he stayed with didn't offer him food, but maybe because of what he was going through, he lost appetite for meal. And that is why he spent the three, he stayed there three days without food uh, and, and water, and he was praying. He was seeking God's face. God, what just happened? How am I going to remain blind the rest of my life? What, how am I going to live a life like this? Well, God spoke to Ananias, gave Ananias the full details of where Saul was, and sent Ananias to go and call him. And uh, uh, sorry to go and pray for him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias wanted to object because of what he knew 
about the situation. But God told him, I've already known all those things. Go your way and do as I've told you. And Ananias immediately obeyed. Miracle took place and uh, Saul received his sight and life came back and he stayed there with the brethren in Damascus for some time. One of the things I noticed as I read that passage and as I pre prepared this was that Saul, even though he was persecuting the church, he was against the believers, but he was like a diamond that was in the rock. You know, the precious metals that people use today like diamond, uh, they occur in the rock. You dig the ground, dig the earth to go and mine them. And when you bring them out initially, they may be in the rough. In the rough, they may, be, uh, uh, they may contain impurities. The edges may not be as uh, uh, sharp as it, it ought to be. And they may not reflect the amount of light that they can reflect when uh, they've been refined and polished and, and cut into the right shape. And but then these precious mirrors, when they are found and refined, they become precious uh, stone. And I'm using that as illustration of human beings as well, that sometimes the vessels that God used to accomplish his work, sometimes they also, uh, uh, they started off by appearing in the rock. And when you see them in the rock, you can write them off. You can say, <clears throat> this one will not amount to anything good. This one it will be a problem in this world. But God is still in the business of fishing out those pressures uh, from the rock and transforming them into vessels of honor for his service. And Paul was one of such individuals. His name was Saul. Initially, later on, he changed to Paul the apostle. So Saul was in the rock when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. All his needs to turn the rock into a polished diamond is an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Filled with hatred against the gospel, the Bible tells us in the passage we read, he was still breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciple. He wasn't satisfied that the church in Jerusalem has been scattered and all the believers have uh, uh, escaped to other towns and countries and only the apostles were left in Jerusalem. He wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted to make sure that wherever they are, they are destroyed. And the name of Jesus Christ is completely destroyed. So that that message that Jesus came into the world to, to give to people will not be known. Well, nobody can stop the plan of God. And Jesus encountered him. Because we are told that suddenly they shine ran about him a light from heaven. That is all it takes to transform a rough a vessel into a, 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 a vessel of honor in God's hand. Now, I don't know what the believers were thinking about at the time they saw Saul. When they saw Saul consenting to the killing of Stephen, when they saw Saul persecuting the early church, I, I'm sure there may be people then that prayed, God, maybe you can even kill him and remove him from the face of the earth. Or, God, this person is a trouble to us. Maybe something needs to happen to put a stop to him. Well, that may have been in the mind of those uh, apostles. Th that could have formed part of their prayers. The Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know exactly what may have been in their mind. But one thing I want to mention to Rose is that God does not give up on anybody. The souls you see today may become the pulse of tomorrow by the grace of God. The persecutor you see today can become the prince of preacher at tomorrow. And so when we see uh, people in their rough stages, in their rough states, we shouldn't give up, but we should pray. Pray constantly, pray continuously. Because the God that touched the heart of Saul and changed him into Paul the Apostle is still alive today. He can change anybody. If God can change, could change uh, a Saul and make him to become a prince of preachers, then God can change anybody. He can do it anytime, any moment. 
And uh, what we notice here is that they had, um, just like the Bible tells us that in the book of um, um, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, uh, verse 7, that God doesn't look at external appearance alone. He looks at their heart. When we look at people and look at situations, look at what is going on, what we can see are the externals, the behavior, the attitudes, the, uh, the, all that is going on. We cannot see through to the heart. Of course, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking, the behaviors we can see. But sometimes we cannot fully understand what led to that. We could see from the actions of Paul, uh, Saul, how he was persecuting the early church, scattering the church in Jerusalem. We could say, yes, out of the abundance of the heart, he did all those evil. So he hated Christians. He wanted to destroy the early church. He wanted to do this. But one thing we cannot understand is uh, uh, the true condition of the heart. Or the thing that really motivated all this. Now, let me tell you, in this book of Acts, there were uh, 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 Paul was Saul was not the only person that was persecuting the early church. In fact, in the next few chapters we're going to study, we'll see another man by name Herod. Herod also killed uh, uh, be, 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 be believers. He didn't want the gospel to progress, and yet in the case of Herod, God simply struck him dead. But in the case of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, God appeared to him, transformed him, and used him as a preacher. What's the difference? Because God looked straight into their hearts. God understood what was driving them. Was it ignorance? Was it a, a rebellion? What, what, what was it? And he could see in Saul of Tarsus that Saul was sincerely ignorant of the real thing. He was just zealous, trying to preserve the religion of the fathers, uh, uh, but not actually knowing that God's plan has brought grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when God saw that, God decided to step in. And in, in, in his own case, God decided to save him and use him for the gospel. Isaiah chapter 55 tells us, my thoughts are not your thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than, than yours. That was God speaking. Our thoughts are different from God's thoughts. And this is where we need to seek the face of God, come close to God and say, God, help us understand what is going on, what is happening, and what we need to do in this particular case. So overpowered by the light, he fell to the ground. And he heard what he never thought he would hear. He heard a voice. And the voice asked him the question, unthinkable question, soul song, why persecutest thou me? He didn't see anybody. He just heard the voice. And so because he didn't see, he didn't know who was speaking, he asked, Lord, who are you? Who art thou? And Jesus Christ answered, I am Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, the son of God. I am Jesus that you are persecuting. You know here, Saul was thinking that I am persecuting Peter, John, James, all these early believers that uh, don't follow the traditions of the elders, the traditions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Those are the people I'm persecuting, but he did not know that each of those uh, believers is a part of the body of Christ. And whatever you do to the body of Christ, you are doing it to Jesus Christ. It is like Jesus Christ being the whole human being. And we ourselves being like the individual cells or individual organs like fingers, eye, nose, and that. Anytime you touch a finger, you are touching Jesus himself. God himself said as elsewhere in the Bible that anybody that touched you touches the apple of God's eye. In other words, we are like the apple in God's eyes. And so anybody that touches any of us, persecutes any of us, do any evil thing to us, he is doing it directly to Christ. Jesus made a similar statement that whosoever shall give a cup of cold water to a righteous man because he's righteous, because he loved God, he's doing it to me. 
and his work will not be, uh, uh, be forgotten. So whatever we do to any believer, to any minister of the gospel, even if that believer is just a new convert, just young person, we are doing it directly to God. And you see the same story being brought out very clearly in Matthew 25 when Jesus Christ was talking about uh, the separation of the sheep from the good. Everybody will resurrect and they will divide them into two categories. One on his right side, one, on the, one group on the left. And he will say to the, uh, to the uh, uh, sheep, well, I was hungry, you fed me, I was naked, you clothed me, I was sick, you did this to me, you helped me. And they will say, Jesus, when did we see you in this condition and did those things to you? And Jesus will, will, will answer saying, as long as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you were doing it to me. And he will turn to the goats on the left hand side and say, I was sick, you didn't visit, uh, you didn't visit me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was hungry, you didn't give me food. And they will ask, Jesus, you are telling lies. When did we see this and see that and see, and see all those things and didn't minister to you? And Jesus says, as long as you didn't do it to any of these my uh, people, you were not doing it to me. So that tells us that whatever we do to any believer, we are doing it directly to God, whether it is good or evil. He, 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 he got a, 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 an understanding here of what was taking place. In, a, in astonishment, he asked a, a great question. It's a question that we all need to, to ask, a question that should fill our mind. And the question was, Lord, what will you have me to do? That is what we need to ask. That is what we need to know. God, why am I here? What do you want me to do? In this home, what do you want me to do? What is my role? In my place of work, what do you want me to do? In the society, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with my life? In this society, in this church, wherever I am, what do you want me to do? And God's answer to that question played out in the rest of his life as he was transformed from Saul to, to Paul, a vessel of honor in God's hand. Let's sincerely seek the face of God and ask God. God will speak. God will make it clear. God will make you understand. Lord, what do you want me to do? Why am I here? How do you want me to act? How do you want me to behave? And the transformation has started through uh, the tr transformation in the life of Saul, started through the ministry of uh, uh, Ananias. But before then, let me just make one more comment regarding that question that uh, Saul asked the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, what will thou have me to do? You see, for Saul to ask that question, open-ended question, it means he was prepared to do whatever God wanted him to do. And he knew that what God wanted him, would want him to do may be completely different from what he himself wanted to do. He has lived a Pharisee. He has got a program of work he set uh, 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 his mind on doing that was persecuting the early church, scattering them, destroying it, making the name of Jesus Christ not to be heard and not to be known. That was his program. He wanted to become the best of the Pharisees, the religious people at that time. He was trained by the best teachers at the time. And when you ask God a question like this, Lord, what will you have me to do? You better be prepared for the answer because the answer that you get from God may be different from what you would have wanted to hear. When Jonah heard the word of God, Jonah, go to Nineveh, Nineveh and preach the gospel. That was the last thing Jonah wanted to do. That is why he gathered his money, went and paid uh, for shipment to travel to Tarshish, which is in the opposite direction of where Nineveh was. But God had to intervene, and God eventually got him to where God wanted him to be. And so, we need to ask, it's, a, it's an important question we need to ask because God has a purpose for us. 
And your life cannot be truly meaningful if you don't discover God's purpose for your life. If you don't discover God's plan for your life and live it out, you will be wasting your time living a purposeless life, a life that doesn't satisfy, a life that doesn't bring glory. And maybe when your life is over on earth and you, uh, if you manage to get to heaven, God will now show you the blueprint of what your life could have been if you have listened to him. And it would be a time of regret. And I pray none of us would be in that type of situation. Now, that means that Saul was prepared to change his mind, to abandon his plan, and to follow what God wants him to do. I think it was this week or some, uh, a few days ago, I posted uh, a material on the Liz Christian Meetup WhatsApp group and website. A small message there that change is an evidence of growth. And I went on to add there a quote that was made by a, a man called John Patterson. John Patterson says, only fools and dead men don't change. In other words, it is necessary, it is essential, it is important, it is a requirement in life if we are to carry on living, if we are to make progress, if we are to live as God wants us to live, change is inevitable. And when we change, we are growing, we are developing, we are becoming better. And John Patterson made that statement that it's only fools and dead men that don't change. Dead men there implies dead people. So uh, uh, fools, and he went on to explain that fools won't. In other words, they know what to do. They know the change that is required. They know how to be different, but they won't. They've made up their mind. This is how I am. I cannot change. You cannot train an old dog. I will carry on. Pride feels such life. And they don't want to make any change that will enable them to become better for God and live as God wants them to live. But then he also talked about another category of people that will not change. And those are dead people. Dead people because they can't. And if you are the type of person that doesn't change, you need to ask yourself, which of these categories do I belong to? Am I a category of the fool who because of pride and arrogancy will not change at all? Or am I in the category of dead men, spiritually dead, insensitive to God, no life of God, and therefore, I uh, have no ability to change and become who God wants you to be. So Paul asked that question because he was prepared to change. When you ask God question, be prepared to change because the answer that God gives you may be different from the plan you have, from the program you made for yourself and from what you want to do. He wasn't the only person that changed because we can see here that the transformation that started in the life of Saul came through the ministry of Ananias, who led Saul to salvation and discipled him for the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Ananias was there in Samaria, and it wasn't like in these days, the today world, where you have telephone, social media, WhatsApp, and everything. Samaria was far from, Jer is it Samaria or Damascus was far from, Jerusalem. But we are told then there was a, in verse 10, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Maybe he was also one of those in Jerusalem that ran uh, to, to Damascus as a result of the scattering of the early church. And the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayed and had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. God had all the details. God knows the dream you had last night. He knows what is in your mind and so on. But look at verse 13. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many. You heard by many people. That's what I was saying. Though it wasn't the age of uh, social media, telephone, mobile phone, where messages can be sent uh, rapidly, but he stayed in touch. He heard what was going on. 
He knew what was going on. We ought to know so as to inform our plans and decisions. I have heard of, by many uh, of this man how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. So he had the facts. He knew. In other words, left for him alone, Saul would have been the last person he would have wanted to go and minister to. Or he would have wanted to go and pray, and, and pray for. He didn't want to do it. It wasn't something that was appealing. But God spoke. And do you know, the Bible says God spoke to him. Uh, 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 Ananias saw it. Uh, uh, God spoke to him in a vision. And said, rise up, go. Even though it was in a vision, he knew this vision was not because of what I ate last night. It's not because of anything that is going on. He knew this is from God. We need to have that close relationship with God to such a point that we will know which dream is from God, which vision is from God, and know how to respond. And so when God spoke to him and he answered and gave all those reasons why he should not, the Bible tells us that God said uh, to him, uh, go thy way, verse 15. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 17, immediately Ananias dropped all his argument, dropped all the stories he was telling. He changed his mind and Ananias went his way, entered into the house and putting his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, you notice the language is used here. He didn't call him sinner Saul, persecutor Saul, or any of those things, or Pharisee Saul. He said, Brother Saul. He knew that when Jesus meets a person and has a mission for that person, that person is no longer an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's no longer an enemy of the gospel. He is now a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ. He's living for God. He's doing the work of God. So, and Nanayas became a key part, a key instrument in the life of, uh, 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 of Saul that was later on changed into Paul the Apostle. And brethren, yes, Ananias had his own thoughts, his own feelings, his own ideas based on what he knew about Saul. Supposing today God were to speak to you to go and preach to somebody who may be a notorious sinner, maybe a notorious drug dealer, maybe a notorious criminal, would you do? Or would you sit down to educate God on what crime this person has committed, the lifestyle this person is living, uh, what this person is trying to do, and so on? God already knew all those things. He doesn't require a lecture from me or from you. If God tells you, go and speak to that person, maybe the person is a prostitute, or he said, uh, 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 doing certain bad things, would you obey? Would you be the Ananias that will arise and simply go and do? Because God can use you to transform the life of a soul into a Paul. God can use you to accomplish great work for his glory. So let's be open to the Lord and let's uh, uh, stay in a state that we know, yes, that the treasures that God wants to use may be in earthen vessels. And so let's not be uh, put off by the earthen vessels and by some of the things we see. Let's keep looking up to God, trusting in God, and praying that these people will come to know the Lord and will become vessels of honor in the hands of the Lord. So today you may be that Ananias that God wants to use to disciple Saul. To do so, you must be willing to let go what you know about Saul and act on divine instructions of the moment to minister life and power to the fallen of the society. There are many people that are fallen in the society and God wants to use you to uh, reach out to them and to help them, to enable them stand up again and become channels that God can use. Now, 
we have seen from the life of Saul here that he was a diamond in the rough. Uh, and also made a comparison with Herod. Why did God use Saul, but he didn't use Herod? You see, this is what we need to understand about God. It is our response, our attitude, our willingness to repent, our willingness to be open to God, our willingness. Yes, we may have done things, and those things may have been wrong. We may have gone places, those places may not have been places God wanted us to go. But today, the Bible says, when you hear his voice today, harden not your heart, repent. What God is looking for is people that will repent, people that will change their mind, people that will turn around, people that when the light of God comes, they will drop all the bad they were doing and begin to follow that light of God so that they can be transformed into vessels of honor that will bring glory unto the Lord. And if we are willing to be in that kind of state, humble, willing to learn, willing to know, willing to make amends, willing to adjust, to change our plans, then God will use us to accomplish great things to the glory of his holy name. We are living in the very end time. There is quite a lot going on in the world today. And there is quite a lot of uh, uh, questions that have no answers, a lot of different uh, opinions and different causes, different people are trying to promote. In, the, in, in this time, God is still looking for people, the people that do know their God, that will be strong and will do exploit. And you can be that person that God can use. I can be that person that God can use. And today, you may even be the diamond in the rock. You don't see yourself as being good enough for anything that God wants to use. Maybe you see yourself as unfit. Maybe you've made terrible mistakes in the past and you feel, oh, I have blown it completely. Do you know if today you will call upon the Lord with a sincere heart, with a heart of prayer, with a heart that is contrite and repent and come back to the Lord that you can still become the vessel of honor in God's hand. David missed it completely when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and killed the husband so as to marry her and to cover up the sins that he has committed. But when the sins was brought to the attention of David, what did David do? David prayed. David cried to God and says, God, forgive me. And what was David praying for? He didn't say, oh, God, give me long life. Give me prosperity. Enlarge my coast. Make me to become a bigger and greater and more deep. No, he was praying, God, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He has lost something. Have you lost something because of your past attitude, past behaviors? Well, you still have life. And because you still have life and Jesus has not come yet, the door is not closed. You can repent today. You can turn around this very moment and you can become that diamond that is transformed into a vessel of honor. Uh, 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 refined from the rope and made to become a precious vessel in the, in the hand of God. We are going to pray right now. And I want you to open up to God and call upon God and say, God, help me to have that kind of contrite heart. You know, yes, as I mentioned, like the life of David, you could see where the heart of David was. Even though he did these terrible things, yet when you compare him to the king before him, Saul, well, we are not told that Saul did some of those type of terrible things like adultery and murder and all these things. Most of the things were disobedient. But why did God reject Saul? Because Saul didn't have that type of mind that was after God, that would repent immediately. When Prophet Samuel pointed out to Saul the sins he has committed, what was Saul doing? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know it is wrong. I know it is, but please come and honor me before the people. Let's go and offer sacrifice, business as usual. That's what he was interested in. 
He was interested in prestige, in position, in rituals, in all those routines to make him look great among the people. But David was not like that. This is what made the difference. This is also the thing that made the difference between Saul and, uh, uh, and Herod that I mentioned earlier on. God chose Saul to become Paul a preacher, but God killed Herod. Both of them were persecutors of the early church. And what will make you to become a vessel of honor? It is just your attitude. God's love is great. He's powerful. He can forgive. He can forget. He can cleanse uh, uh, you from all the past. He can transform you. You can make a new beginning. And you can become that vessel of honor in God's hand. I believe that every one of us could be a diamond in the rock. Uh, and tonight, we can come to God and say, God, take me, refine me, push me, uh, 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 purify me, and make me to become a precious metal, a precious vessel of honor in your hand. Let's talk to God in prayer. I want you to pray. I want you to call upon God. I want you to talk to God about yourself. Are you like a diamond in the rock? God can process and refine you today into a precious vessel. Are you the Ananias that God wants to use to bring salvation to a soul and to disciple that soul in the way of the Lord so that that soul can live according to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because all he knew before were just the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We need to call upon God right now. Ask the Lord to help and see us through. Yes, God can use us, can use you as soul that became Paul. He can use you as Ananias. But we must be willing, willing to change. Remember from what John Patterson said, that it's only fools and dead men that don't change. Fools, not because they cannot change, but because they just won't change. They've made up their mind never to change. And for dead men, they are dead. They can't. So that is the only two groups of people. And I pray you will not be in any of those groups. You will be like Saul that was willing to change his plan, his ambition, his purpose, his program. You will be like uh, 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 David that immediately repented and wrote all the things that he did to be published so that other people can learn from that. Just call upon him. Surrender to him. Ask God that tonight, don't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow may be too late. Don't wait till another year. Another year may be too late. Call upon God right now. Ask God to help. Ask God to intervene. Ask God to perfect that which concerns you. God can do it. God can help. Yes, the past may have been dirty, bad, but the blood of Jesus is still powerful, is still available to cleanse, to wash, to change, and to help. The grace of God is still sufficient to turn a sinner into a sin, to, so, to turn a soul into a Paul. Call upon him right now. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Our blessed Father, we just thank you for what you've taught us this evening. You've shown us from your word that there is hope if we are going to repent, if we are going to follow you, if we are going to change, I pray, dear Lord, that you will take us. Even if we were like a diamond in the rock, take us, push us, cleanse us, and make us to become who you want us to be in Jesus' name. I look up to you this day. I call upon you this moment. I ask, dear Savior and King, mighty Father and everlasting King, your hand will help us, God. Your power will see us through. Your goodness and mercy will make ways for us in Jesus' name, I pray. I just call upon you this day. I look up to you this moment. I ask, dear Savior and King, Father, divine, have your way, help, and see us through help, and make ways for us, dear King, in Jesus' name, I pray. Dear Father, I ask, dear Lord, you open our eyes. Just like the scales fell off the eyes of Saul. Those were the things that prevented him from seeing the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, whatever is blinding us from seeing the truth, from knowing the truth, from living the life you want us to live, I pray, God, let all those scales be removed 
from our eyes. Open our eyes to see and help us to follow you with all our heart. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen.